Uh, we, we would like to introduce our next uh, speakers. It's uh, Shimon Bazar and Marcus Meeson, and they have brought uh, a collective called Abake. Uh, it's four graphic designers, Patrick Lacey, Benjamin Reichen, Kasia Stahl, and Maki Suzuki uh, from the Royal College of Art, and they just produced together a book, Did Someone Say Participate? Um, maybe to start with that, um, for anyone kind of knowing the writing of uh, Bazaar, I think it's rife with ironies. Did someone say participate? Can you say something about the title? Uh, the title um, is, there's been a lot of uh, open appropriation, I think, this evening, and it was a straight out appropriation from uh, uh, Slavoj Žižek when uh, an essay that he wrote on called Did Someone Say Totalitarianism? Uh, and we simply replaced the word totalitarianism with the word participate. Um, but I think the subtitle of the book is, is just as important. Um, it's an atlas of spatial practice. And, um, and that, that notion of spatial practice is, is really what the book is about. Can you say how? And, yeah? Well, that, there's also an uh, issue in terms of the participation because we don't necessarily mean uh, participation in the sense of uh, kind of uh, community building and so on, but rather that uh, uh, participation in kind of alien fields of knowledge. So, in a way, the kind of, I mean, from our background, which is architecture, the kind of idea that you venture out into different kind of uh, areas of knowledge. Is it about reinvention, maybe? Because somehow, the notion of participation was sort of very authentic uh, at the beginning with people like Jonah Friedman or Gian Giancarlo De Carlo and became then sort of politically instrumentalized and I would say also very degraded. And when Rem Colas and I actually visited Giancarlo De Carlo um, uh, four or five years ago in, in Milano and asked him about this kind of problem, um, he said, I agree with you, if you consider the era of the 60s, there were at the same time two things which were very important. One was the rebellion of the students and the other one was a new consciousness in the trade unions. During that time, I had made two projects. One actually was for the housing complex in Terni and the other was the urban plan for the new center of Rimini, both based on the idea of participation. Then after that moment, a more bureaucratic period began when participation became something very formalistic and stupid. The problem to me had changed it. The question was how to make an architecture which can intrinsically be participated, and this becomes a question of language, so intrinsic participation. I was wondering, sort of seeing this sort of degraded aspect of participation, if your book is about reinvention of participation? I, if, um, if there's an authentic version of participation, ours is probably a very inauthentic. Uh, I think everything that's in the book, in a sense, is inauthentic in relation to other um, original or originary definitions. I think, uh, Marcus, as Marcus mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of um, re uh, resuscitation of participatory kind of projects, whether in art, art practice or in architectural or political works. Um, we're not really dealing with that whatsoever. I think for us, the notion of participation actually refers less to the, uh, to the uh, notion of the public participating and much more into the idea of the practitioner and the different disciplinary practitioners participating in alien uh, fields of knowledge, in a sense. And that, that, that's the focus that we're, we're kind of looking at. And so uh, perhaps one term that kind of might help in this uh, is a term that I kind of try to coin, which is called a professional amateur. Um, and, and in a sense, the professional amateur is he or she that somehow ventures out and deals with the things that he or she is not trained officially to do. Um, and in a sense, uh, I think that's, uh, that's something that all of us um, uh, find incredibly profoundly fundamental to the notion of our practice that somehow kind of not based on expertise and actually constantly putting ourselves in situations where we're actually quite ignorant. Uh, that's also one of the issues we try to address with the spatial practitioner, as it were, because we're trying to get away from the idea of the architect being the one in charge of space. So uh, I think that would also be something interesting uh, to ask you what you think, for example, in terms of your role in a project like Dubai, um, how you think you can uh, intervene in a place like that as an architect? Um, 
Maybe I should explain that uh, after a kind of total uh, focus on China, we, we have kind of recently begun to uh, work in the Middle East and, and uh, in order to increase our knowledge, uh, uh, engage it in an almost massive way so that we are now working in Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Doha, uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so that we really cover the whole thing. And as any beginning uh, architectural enterprise, uh, it's partly based on interest and ignorance. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to kind of reverse this ignorance in a kind of very quick uh, and efficient way. Um, at the same time, uh, what we're testing there is the possibility, and I was actually talking to with uh, with Zaha, I think that her whole explanation was actually very uh, precise, uh, that the Middle East, in, instead of perhaps uh, a kind of zone of inevitable absurdity, uh, could be also a zone where some serious work uh, can be kind of supported or imagined. I, mean, I, I think the re perhaps the reason that Marcus asked the question is that uh, I was in Dubai in, in December, and there was a sense in which uh, if you if you pointed at most buildings and you asked people who designed that, the name of the architect was absolutely irrelevant. W what mattered was the name of the uh, the developer of the construction mm -hmm. company, possibly the engineer. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of went the emir, then the, uh, the the head of the construction company, who's a brother-in-law or related to the family, then the engineer, and then somewhere five or six was the architect. And one of the construction companies told us that they only work with four architectural firms in the world, all of which are kind of the anonymous acronyms. And it's an interesting point this year, particularly, where they're inviting people like you and Zaha and so on and so forth. And one wonders whether uh, your position um, as kind of signature architects will, will fit within that kind of hierarchy or whether you'll be able to transcend it. Well, it's... I, th I think there's a number of firms there that, that kind of really uh, rules not only Dubai, but, but in fact the whole world. And actually there, there was a kind of um, interesting uh, discussion with Peter Seville where he was kind of asserting that still the West is leading in creativity. And I think that this uh, actually a kind of really sad illusion or uh, kind of lack of awareness because uh, if you're in Dubai, what you really see is that exactly that is the initiative or the authority that we completely lost or maybe abandoned or deserved to, uh, to lose. And so there is uh, an, an enormous amount of new firms like uh, Atkins, uh, Helcro, that no one frankly has ever heard of before, uh, that are doing uh, work that is 80% um, identical to the work of uh, star architects. So I think that um, the beauty of that situation is that uh, it will probably kill the whole notion of uh, this kind of architecture. And, and I think it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned personally, it, it has forced me in, in a kind of serious investigation uh, of our own work and, and kind of tactical adjustment of, of our own work toward a more generic, boring style. It's a kind of generic signature. Uh, which is an in interesting conflation somehow, because on the one hand, I mean, in a sense, the architect is brought in precisely as the set designer, as mm -hmm. the one who sort of adds the ornament, uh, the kind of dressing. Um, and there's a kind of uh, something quite liberating about the honesty of yeah. that, yeah. actually, I think. Um, perhaps I, I just try and bring that round to the, uh, to the, the flip side of that, which is if, if one can kind of um, uh, observe these kind of mutations in terms of the power, uh, the power of the architect or indeed the impotence of the architect in the global context. I think what we've been trying to do with the book is actually look at the flip side of that, which is the kind of power, uh, the empowerment of the idea or the, or, or the notion of uh, space, space or spatiality or those controlling, controlling space, but, pr but precisely through the lens of, uh, of those who are not architects. So in a sense, the kind of um, the increased capital value of uh, constructs of space, be it in notions of sort of geography, politics, philosophy, graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. And in a way, I think uh, whilst there's been uh, a lot said about the kind of uh, growing impotence of the architect over the last 10 years, 
um, somehow one can, uh, one can at the same time uh, see uh, uh, an empowering of architecture, but I, paradoxically, not through architects, yeah. through everyone else. Yeah. And that's yeah. actually one of the things that uh, the book tries to do. And perhaps uh, I could maybe hand over to Mackie here, because in, in a sense, they could, uh, Obaka could be uh, nominally uh, described as graphic designers, but it's, it, it's a sort of poverty of description in the same way of describing Peter Saville, I think, as a graphic designer. It's a kind of poverty of, of terminology. Um, Perhaps, uh, Maki, you could say something about, uh, I, I, I must add that the way the book is put together is an absolutely instrumental kind of collaboration with, with Orbaka. And I think that the way in which, as quote-unquote graphic designers, their uh, emphasis is actually on content um, and the kind of form of content uh, has been kind of quite fundamental to the, to the book. Maki, perhaps you'd like to say something about the nature of the practice of, uh, of Orbaka. Um, it, it's less maybe about, about us, but uh, ju just before we go too deeply into the book itself. Well, uh, actually, before, because we made a PDF of the book, and what's just passing by on the screen is um, the end papers. And just since you can see that there, it, uh, it's kind of a reaction to, to the book itself or what's inside it. We took all the different shapes of all the flags in the world and separated them. Uh, so in there you would find, you know, all the stars or all the eagles separated. And then we also made it into a little um, font dedicated to the book. So you can in a way uh, construct your own flag by typing different things. Maybe it's better if you have a look at the book itself. And I'm not suggesting that you should buy it now. But, um, why not? Yeah. <laughs> but actually I just wanted to explain why we dressed up and uh, it's not necessarily to to be dressed up for this occasion, where we actually go into the wedding of a friend who's an architect, and we were thinking of a present for him. And obviously maybe the book was the cheapest option, and um, hmm. we were also thinking of how to make it a bit more interesting for him, and it's gonna happen tomorrow, so can I, I would really love if everybody could sign it, and uh, of course not everybody knows him, but you probably know someone who, got married and uh, or happily married. So if you can just think of that and add to this particular book and I, I'll put a pen with it. Uh, please now, do so. Of course, as I would say, Robert Filiou, vive le mariage. Actually, <laughs> question to Marcus and Schumann because this is it's clearly a change of format here because it's when the interview turns into a book launch or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not an interview, this is a book launch. And at the same time, I mean, you both proposed that we would um, uh, bring in Abake, and so that also has, I think, a lot to do with this sort of incredible promiscuity of collabor collaborations in which you operate, and I'm reading through the text, there are all kinds of other collaborations of your magazines, and that is another group in which I think you're all somehow involved. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this sort of uh, collaborative practice among each other and how this sort of works. What can we say about our open, uh, our open relationships with each other? Um, it's it's, it's sort of, um, I don't know. There's a, there's, a, there's a commitment to promiscuity, I think, which, um, you know, if I'm gonna be all sort of, I'm trying to take that, uh, all heavy-handed about it, I think, I mean, we all graduated, well, I think we graduated in 2000, um, which makes it very e easy to mythologize, and Marcus graduated a few years after that. And I think one of the things that happened um, at that point, um, towards the late 90s, um, you got, uh, I mean, I, was, I suddenly became very aware of, of kind of collectives, um, particularly in graphic design, actually. I think some of the most notable graphic uh, collectives were in graphic design. But then suddenly there was this sort of uh, uh, resuscitation of, of sort of, again, 60s um, collectives and groups, the Archigrams, Archizooms, and so on and so forth. And I think somehow in the 1990s, whilst um, myself, I worked for Zaha Hadid, um, Marcus worked for Daniel Lieberskind. We kind of, um, if the 1990s was an attempt to emulate our, um, our masters and mistresses, by the time we got to the 2000s, we, th we thought, fuck it. And, uh, and there was an attempt, I think, to um, try and come up with something alternative to the notion of an individual uh, mythologizing star character. And that somehow ended up, um, has ended up being in a, in a series of incredibly free form, promiscuous relationships. But, but but they're promiscuous, but probably within quite tight 
circles, I would say. So uh, we are three of seven who produce a magazine called Sexy Machinery, um, which is a kind of art uh, publication collective. Um, and then we're also part of a, a new PhD program that A.L. Weissman has di is directing as our half of the book. Um, and I think this is something, and it go, perhaps if I could just uh, swerve it back to London, because I'm anticipating your London kind of question, Hans <laughs> Um Somehow, um, I'm, I'm quite openly sentimental uh, about attributing this authorship to London, somehow. And this sense in which we're all um, kind of self-exiles here. And that self-exile means that you often get lonely. And the loneliness um, can be satiated somehow by meeting each other occasionally. I think, uh, just quickly to add, there's also an issue in London, I think, about optimism, which uh, there's a lot of other places where that optimism is, isn't quite so kind of uh, radical. And uh, I think that really kind of helps for these kind of collaborations. And maybe it's interesting to hear from Abake about London, because I read an interview you gave where you kind of said that you chose London as a decision by default. I was interested in hearing about that. Well, we met at the um, Royal College of Art, which is just an MA, so uh, most of the people are coming from somewhere else. And uh, so we already decided at college to work together, but Kaisa is from Sweden, Patrick is from Wales, and Benjamin is uh, French, and so am I. So yeah, it is by default because we didn't know where to go back to, or then it would have been completely undemocratic, so we just stayed, and, and we're very happy to have done so. But then as a consequence, since we were working from here, we had to be democratic again, and um, that's why our name is Swedish, and our email address is French. <laughs> yes. Where does the Welsh come in? Yeah. Well, he's over there. Patrick <laughs> is Welsh, by the way, and um, I think he needs to be represented somewhere. Yeah, but he doesn't speak Welsh. That's true. <laughs> But the thing is that uh, the, the nature of graphic design is, is also um, something that we've been very anxious about. And uh, we had the preconception that maybe it would, we would be at the end of this shitty stick where we get given a content which we can like or not, but then we have to design it. And obviously, it's very difficult for us to, to um, polish a turd, as to, one can to? To po polish a turd, yeah. as one can say. So one, one way to, to make sure that this doesn't happen or to, to help this to not happen is to be a bit more proactive in terms of in content. So that's why uh, co-editing this magazine with uh, uh, architects or textile designers is sort of vital. But also we started a record label because we were very anxious to designed some, uh, a record of uh, musicians that we wouldn't really like so much. I, um, uh, I just want to uh, kind of for one moment uh, abandon all uh, pretension that you're a collective and kind of really focus on you uh, and, and focus on you as a writer uh, of a kind of amazing uh, fluidity and versatility uh, as much as home in irony, gossip, seriousness, earnestness, with a kind of very wide repertoire. How did that happen? And, and <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm uh, going to be speechless now. I, uh, I only now. I'm only now finding out it's, huh? it's happened. If it's happened, um, it's because I've... Uh, and and uh, one more addition. Uh, I think that part of the incentive is uh, what used to inspire writing in general, the kind of obligation to produce, to earn money. <laughs> Probably, as with everyone, it goes back to one's parents. And I think com being sort of first generation Bangladeshi um, with, a, with a doctor father, um, uh, where one, one knew growing up that you know, there were about three, prof three legitimate professions that you were you're entitled to somehow grow up into, and they were, you know, they swarmed around that being a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. Um, and so when I uh, when I mooted to my mother that I might do English, she said, "Well, you know, uh, I don't think so, because uh, what sort of job are you going to get with that?" So I, I tried it with fine art. She was like, "What? You're going to be an artist? Ha!" 
So, and then I said, oh, architecture? Oh, okay, yeah, architecture is fine. <laughs> and I think architecture is fine because somehow you can be, uh, you can be mediocre in architecture and still have a living. Um, whereas I think if, uh, if you're mediocre as an artist, uh -uh, it ain't happening. Um, so I think, it, I think the kind of um, the, thing with, uh, the thing with words was sort of always there. And then uh, I, I had the privilege of just having quite amazing um, professors at Cambridge. I had Peter, Peter Carl, who's an extraordinary, um, uh, extraordinary um, um, uh, mentor almost. Uh, and then I was at the AA, um, and it's just through a succession of, um, and I have to say actually, perhaps I'm just realizing now what the key point was. The key point was the moment we decided to do this magazine, Sexy Machinery, because I think at nine, uh, there were two reasons. Uh, we started in 1999, which was the, the height of the, uh, of the dot-com kind of hysteria. Uh, there were all these sort of accusations flying around it. It was the end of print. Um, everything was going to go online. Uh, physical matter didn't matter anymore, so and so forth. Uh, and I think we were, we were just on the cusp, I think, in terms of a generation where we were still um, old, old enough to be kind of romanticists about the print. Um, and then at the same time, in terms of the content, I think at, at that time, in terms of architectural um, avant-garde, uh, things had got incredibly uh, onanistic. Uh, they'd become completely devoid of any sort of relation to the world, you know, and everyone was uh, reciting like the same two pages from Deleuze, um, never having read all the other 328 pages. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and there was a point at which I think it was maybe reading something like Zizek and Dave Hickey, who for me are two kind of key, key writers actually, where, where they both let in, I think, the, the things that are considered in, in sort of uh, postmodern uh, discourse to be debased, no? to be part of sort of popular culture, which is, was something that wasn't happening archite in architectural culture. And that seemed to me to be like incredibly, uh, again, uh, some, uh, creating a poverty in terms of the discourse. So. Maybe a nice conclusion. Yeah. Could, could we, we ask, could I ask you a question, perhaps? Yeah, of course. Um, which is that and it goes back to your, quest, your thing about reinvention, perhaps, which is we're sitting in this pavilion, and this pavilion, for me, reminds me of uh, if any of those who've been to the Future City show. I think this pavilion could legitimately be shown uh, in the Future City show with the, with the date 2006 scratched out, and sort of any date between 1968 and 1972 replaced, and we would believe that it belonged to, the, to that period. When, you were, when we were discussing this, Do you uh, agree? <laughs> uh, Hans Ulrich, uh, you said, yeah, the, the, the marathon's going to be fantastic. Uh, it's going to be like Woodstock. And yeah. then another day, it's going to be like Deleuze's Mille Plateau, which is very interesting. Um, and, and somehow, so somewhere between like 1968, 72 happenings uh, and uh, Woodstock, what is the nature of this kind of, uh, of this uh, revisionism? I mean, in terms of your reinvention, um, is this kind of romantic nostalgia, or what is the nature? Because it's, it's too obvious, it's too in our face, I think, to be discarded as anything other than that. Could you please say something about that? I mean, we've tried to address it uh, tonight, actually, in numerous of the conversations in relation to that idea, actually, of it being not nostalgia, but it being eventually about a toolbox to which extent such moments you know, can be uh, a toolbox. And I think it's obviously always about you know, repetition and difference. So I don't think that it's kind of the of nostalgia. But I think I can't really answer the first sort of question about the pavilion, because I actually don't think that this pavilion would have been built that way in 68 to 72. Rem, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe in terms of the content, there's also an issue uh, because you're talking about a kind of slice, taking a slice of London at a particular time. And I'm just wondering, for example, with Damien, who was really nostalgic about the 90s, how do you think that fits into the content of this uh, marathon? Well, I think that uh, as a slice, it's working very well. Uh, kind of, and and uh, I think that that is also uh, kind of perhaps totally different uh, to Woodstock. I think Woodstock was not a kind of surgical kind of effort, but more uh, a kind of gloating or, or kind of a celebration, inarticulate celebration. And uh, if anything, this is a kind of evening uh, that is drowning in articulation. Kind of, uh, 
So and that's a big difference. Right and I think there. also it yeah. has not really yeah. to do, I mean, you know, the format has nothing really to do with Woodstock. It has to do, you know, with just thinking about how one can invent different kind of rules of the game. And I think it's interesting, you know, I'm, my, my main kind of uh, activity is to organize exhibitions. And uh, the medium of exhibition has been, throughout the 20th century, subject, uh, you know, to, to all kinds of uh, different rules of the game. I mean, there have been uh, many, many things have been tried out in terms of gallery gestures, in terms of display features. We're going to have Richard Hamilton later this, this morning, I mean, one of the great pioneers of invention of new display features. And in some kind of weird way, discursive events, if it's conversations or symposium or conference, have actually not really tried that to the same extent. It's still sort of usually the same kind of format of time. It's a round table. It happens usually sort of in the evening from 7 to 9 or 6 to 8 or whatever. That's true all over the world. Maybe there is some Q&A afterwards and maybe a dinner follows. And uh, so our, just, I mean, very simply to kind of break that and think about different formats, we think is an extraordinary opportunity. And uh, uh, I mean, I realized that for the first time when I started actually to do conferences and we canceled a conference and maintained it anyhow. So everything took place but the conference. So it became a kind of a coffee break and all the speakers were there, slightly confused because the conference was not there. But a lot of things actually started. And ever since, I've actually thought we should experiment more and more with that format. And it has, in this sense, only just begun. No, I, I really didn't mean it in any way disparaging, no, no, quite, no. quite the opposite, no, no, no. actually. It's a very good question. But quite I think I have a question for you. We cannot actually leave and go into the break because we're going to have a break now, actually, before asking you the only recurrent question in this <laughs> marathon, which is about your unrealized project. I wanted to ask what are the unrealized projects of uh, Schumann, Marcus, and Abaki? Um, Maki? Maybe just one. Maybe you should ask that each. question in 30 years. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe we could turn it around. What's your uh, unrealized project, Ren? Uh, I, no comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too, too, man, too numerous to mention. Huh? Perhaps I could answer it in a very glib yeah. way, which is uh, to, to have many unrealized projects, um, in, in a sense. Yeah. I think that's something that one uh, visiting something like the Future City Show, you, uh, one realizes the, the, the profound importance, actually, of projects that are, are put forward and that never happen. And that, in a sense, they are, they are more often than not the ones that actually really count in the long run, I think. So. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Shumamba Zamakas.